All right. Welcome, Voice friends, to the very second edition of Interviews on Voice Matters. And today we have Mary Sandage with us. And Mary is a wonderful human being and a very interesting person to talk with because she knows a lot about exercise physiology and how that applies to the voice. Um, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Disorders at Auburn University. She got her master's in speech language pathology and then her PhD in exercise physiology. And she's written for numerous publications, including the Journal of Voice, correct? Yes. And what are some other publications you've written for? Um, I've written in the journals for the American Speech and Hearing Association. Um, Matt Hoke and I will, are preparing a manuscript for the Journal of Singing. Okay. So, and um, I'm also preparing a manuscript for VASTA, the Voice and Speech Trainers Association. Okay. So um, those are the, the primary places. Okay, great. Um, and then on the website for Aub Auburn University, it says that your special interests are on hormonal influences on vocal function, muscle bioenergetics and fatigue resistance as it pertains to vocal function, and also environmental influences on vocal function. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're kind of all over the place. I'm kind of a giant Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> at, at the middle of which is like occupation specific voice, I guess. I'm, I'm interested in lots of different variables. Okay. So what, what do you mean by occupation specific voice? Well, I think in voice science and in voice uh, rehabilitation and habilitation to a large degree. And, you know, the difference is one is preparing people to use their voice effectively. One is helping them recover, you know, voice function if they've lost adequate voice function. But we, t we tend to treat everybody the same. Um, I know you don't believe that because you're into specificity, but um, you know, a lot of us in the field of voice uh, therapy, and also, I mean, I'm a singing teacher as well, and I think a lot of singing teachers probably, you know, kind of have an approach that's very similar with everybody. Um, and I'm really interested in making things specific to the individual's needs. So it's kind of, I think it might be more like the correlate would be boutique medicine or this idea of genetically specific medications for things. And I think, you know, medicine's really moving in that direction in general is finding things that are uniquely suited to the individual and why shouldn't that apply to muscle physiology and voice training as well. So, and in that regard, I think thinking about what your um, occupation specific requirements are. So yeah. if you're doing a recital versus an opera, those are two very different uh, voice demands versus, um, you know, one or two pieces, perhaps um, in a, you know, in a venue where you don't have to carry the singing load. And then if you look at occupational voice users, telemarketers certainly use their voice very extensively as do classroom teachers compared to um, other individuals who spend more of their day being rather quiet. Um, so I'm interested in applying muscle physiology principles and science to, to, to kind of those aspects of voice. Wow. And, and it's very interesting. You, you were a speech language pathologist for your master's degree, correct? Mm -hmm. How did you end up in exercise physiology for your PhD? How did you bring all that together? Well, I, my whole kind of interest has been very, a bit circuitous, but I've always been a singer and, um, performed a lot in high school and college and studied singing in college, even though I wasn't majoring in music mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm first generation college and I didn't think it was practical to major in music. So I picked something I thought was practical. Um, I ended up with an English and linguistics degree um, and, you know, took an interest test at the counseling service and speech language pathologist came up as an option. And I thought, well, so I, I didn't know what they did. And when I found out they did voice, I thought, wow, that might be a really cool way to blend singing um, into something that, you know, is, is a really good occupation that will make a decent living. You know, and my voice teacher in college, I studied with Janet Alcorn, she would say to me, you're one of the most musical people I have in my studio, but I don't think you're going to make your living singing. I mean, she was just brutally honest with me. You know, it probably would have been great if I would have discovered a different singing style other than classical singing. Um, but she didn't, I mean, that she was, I love that she did that because it kind of forced me to look at something I hadn't considered. And I've been nothing but satisfied with this career choice because I can kind of do lots of different things in one job. So um, I went to the University of Iowa and Kitty Vertolini was in her first faculty job there. So, wow. and Ingo Tietze was there. So my, <laughs> my, my training pedigree is pretty cool. And I, I went there because I was an in-state student. I'm from Iowa. I didn't go there because they were there. I didn't really know it. 
I mean, talk about luck, right? Right. Yeah. So, you know, I learned a lot from Janet Elkhorn about singing pedagogy. I learned an enormous amount from Kitty Verdalini about motor learning principles um, and speaking voice rehabilitation, a lot about physiology from Dr. Tietze and a lot of his doctoral students and postdocs who were there because um, Julie Barkmeyer Kramer was there at the time. Nancy Solomon was there. Um, I mean, just to name a couple. So I, I, I really learned a lot from lots of folks. Then I was fortunate enough to work my way into a job at the University of Wisconsin and specializing in professional voice. And I, I developed their professional voice program there. We ended, you know, I went from having a keyboard I was carrying around from room to room to being able to have a room with a grand piano, which was fantastic. Um, and I noticed during my years of working with folks that I was naturally moving toward specificity or training vocalies is to help them recover the specific skill that they needed to recover. So if someone lost flexibility, instead of giving them a, you know, the, a sheet of paper with warm-ups to do that was the same for everybody, I would design specific warm-ups for specific pieces that they were trying to recover for performance. Because most of the people I see, they're not beginning singers, they're very experienced singers who've run into trouble. Maybe it's their high range, maybe it's easy clean onsets, maybe it's staccato, whatever it is. And so I just found myself naturally moving in that direction. So um, when my husband took a faculty job at Auburn, um, I was, I had decided I would pursue a PhD and, it, and this is a true story. I went to a wine tasting in our community so I could meet some new people in our, in my new town and sitting right next to me was, uh, David Pasco, who was, uh, in the department of kinesiology. And we just struck up a conversation, had a shared interest in respiratory physiology. And uh, I ended up in his lab and got a PhD in his lab. So, Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, I just, I hope that I'm awake for opportunities as they present themselves. And I think that, you know, going to the University of Iowa, studying with those incredible people, being at the University of Wisconsin, which is another big center for voice excellence, um, and then being awake for that opportunity with uh, David Pasco was, was really, really super. And his expertise is in thermoregulation and environmental influences on on muscle physiology and human function. So it made sense for me to look at that aspect of voice when I was in his lab. And we know very little about that. There's a lot of lore and mythology about how the environment affects voice, but we don't really have a lot of good evidence to support or refute it. So I've done some work in that area and I continue to do that. I'll have a paper coming out in um, the Journal of Speech, Language and Hearing on the influence of forced air versus radiant heating and cooling on voice function. Um, and as it turns out, in healthy people, a lot of these things don't really matter. Yeah. 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 I mean, you said so much there. And one of the things that really interests me is the difference between vocal function and style. Yes. And yeah. what I really love working on with people just personally is, mm -hmm. is getting function happening. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And really working on these very specific tasks mm -hmm. so that people can go off and do what they want to do. Because a lot of times singers know how to sing. They know the style they love. They don't need anybody to teach them how to be a gospel singer because they've right. done it their whole lives. Right. But all of a sudden something isn't working. And how do you deal with that? Right. So that brings me to my next question. What are some practical implications of your research or other research in terms of uh, physiology um, and voice in terms of um, really helping people with the, the vocal function aspect of it? Mm -hmm. Well, the probably the most specific application is, you know, my understanding of how vocal folds work and how to make them efficient. I think, and my experience with my own voice really shapes my approach clinically. So a lot of speech language pathologists who don't have a lot of experience with voice in general, and I would say with performing voice specifically, yeah. they tend to just tell people to take a bigger breath because most patients or clients that I see, if their larynx is not functioning appropriately, so they're either closing it too tightly or they're not closing it tightly enough to make it an efficient valve, um, they'll report that they're short of breath, so they're running out of air. And so the first place a lot of clinicians go is, oh, well, let me help you with breath support. And in my experience, some people need uh, help managing their breath, but most people need to learn how to just use their laryngeal valve more efficiently. So in that regard, focusing on how to shape vocal tract tuning, so what happens above the vocal folds, really influences what happens downstream, and then a lot of the other problems are, are generally solved. Um, that, and then I also try to work with super specifically. So, you know, what surprises a lot of singing teachers is I only usually see people 
in a rehabilitative context for probably two, maybe three therapy visits, and then they're on their way. Because I'm not training them from zero. I'm just helping them recover something that they have had a perceptual experience with before. And, and generally, you know, singers are incredibly smart because they have a lot of experience manipulating their instrument. And so I just guide them back to what's comfortable. And then while preserving their style and the sound that they want to have, um, and then they're on their way. So yeah. is that the answer? Yeah. yeah, it does. And I, and I think that also, I would love to hear you speak a little bit more deeply about the, the implications of your research specifically. Um, so where, think of it this way, where do you see your research headed in the next 50 years? Like the foundation that you're setting with what you're doing, where is this headed? So I'm 50 right now. So if I live to be 100 and I keep doing research for the rest of my life, um, you know, I'll tell you what's interesting. I, I've been, had a PhD, what, for five years. So I'm kind of a, I'm a baby at this research, formal research compared to a lot of folks that have really made their name in the area. Um, and so I would say at this point, my research, I'm developing a foundation of work, part of which is environmental influences on voice. And so I've done some really basic work manipulating temperature and humidity and also the HVAC style, whether it's forced air or radiant heat, to see if those are variables that impact voice. And, and my approach to that has been starting with really healthy people to see if there's any. And now what I'd like to do is look at folks with allergies, asthma, people who take drying medications, things that are real life to see how that influences it as well. So that's, that's one arm of what I do. The other piece that I've just started in the last two years, and I've just had two papers accepted, which is super exciting. I'm interested in applying um, muscle bioenergetics to, uh, to voice production. Um, a lot of the classification of whether you are a power athlete or endurance athlete is based on how much force you have to produce and how long the effort lasts. Mm -hmm. And so it's really hard to come up with a, how much power are you producing with your voice algorithm because there's so many variables that go into that other than, I mean, loudness is an obvious place to look, but there's so much more that goes into it than that. So, so I would like to develop a vocal power algorithm that we can actually apply. Um, but while I, that's going to take some time. So while I'm developing that, I'm looking at bioenergetics. So basically what I've done so far is uh, with, a doc, with a master's student of mine, Audrey Smith, we looked at classroom teachers. And this is some data that was collected by Sharon Morrow for her uh, doctoral musical arts degree that she got at the University of Wisconsin. She looked at classroom teachers, elementary school classroom teachers, also elementary school music teachers. Mm -hmm. and she got their vocal dose. So it's a, this is a vibrotactile monitor um, a mic that you... Um, kind of glue on to the skin right above the sternal notch and then that mic is attached to a data logger and the teachers would wear it for eight hours for five days. Wow. And she got an average vocal dose. So the average classroom teacher's vocal folds traveled about two and a half or three kilometers over the course of a day. The average um, elementary school music teacher's vocal folds traveled twice that. So Wow. Uh, right. I mean, and, but, and so that's really interesting. Their voice, they're using their voice extensively throughout the course of the day. But bioenergetically, what we need to look at is what does that look like? Are they talking for a long period of time without any breaks and then they get a break? Or does that day-long dose look like lots of short bursts of loud talking? Because I should be approaching their rehabilitation and habilitation differently if they're more of an endurance athlete versus a power sprint athlete. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Part of what we have to do is understand these work-rest ratios and what these voice-on, voice-off intervals look like. Um, as it turns out, for both groups of classroom teachers, um, and this is a paper that's coming out in uh, the Journal of Speech, Language, and Hearing Research, that's an American Speech and Hearing Association um, publication. Um, what we found was the average classroom teacher, their voice, that they're not usually voicing longer than three second intervals. Almost all of the intervals are less than three seconds. That means they're probably more like a power athlete in that they're using short duration voicing episodes um, broken up by periods of silence, right? And in a natural conversation, we talk a little bit, we're listening, we talk a little bit, we're listening, that's right. right. Bioenergetically, that means that they're using more immediate energy and probably glucose circulating in the blood for muscle fuel and not really oxygen because that's what an endurance athlete does, 
right? Um, compare that to someone who's singing maybe the same amount as a classroom teacher over a whole day in an hour. You know, and a recital performance might be equivalent to that. So same dose, but in 60 minutes instead of over eight hours. That's a really different kind of vocal endeavor. And so I want to think about that from a training, strength and conditioning. How do we train up to that so that we're able to do it without wrecking ourselves, right? Oh, yeah. And part of that speaks to fatigue resistance. I mean, I think we generally think fatigue is a bad thing. Um, and we don't really think about training up to be able to do the task that is being a touring performer, for example, or doing Hamilton, or, you know, where we have Mondays off, but maybe we don't have Mondays off because we're invited to the White House to sing on our Monday off, and so we're still singing anyway, right? Right, and right. Especially a show like that that's gotten so much press. So, like you said, you had mentioned before we started the interview, some people think we're in the horse and buggy days. I, I, I don't know that we're in the horse and buggy days, but I do appreciate how my, my training in exercise physiology and exercise science has really uh, enlivened a whole area of inquiry that I hadn't really thought about deeply before that I think will make, hopefully, will make a big contribution. Yeah, absolutely. Practical, you know, practical contribution. Right, right. I mean, yeah, there, there are so many questions flying through my head. I'm going to try to make sure I'm <laughs> focusing myself and keeping it safe. Me too. <laughs> um, right. Um, so talk about fatigue resistance just a little bit more. So what does that, what does fatigue resistance mean in terms of exercise physiology? What do you, what does that mean? Well, it's a big topic and in fatigue uh, in, within a muscle physiology model, there's generally um, theories based on whether it's central versus peripheral fatigue. Okay. Central fatigue we don't know a lot about and that's hard to study. Part of central fatigue is thinking that you're tired because you've been engaging in an activity for a long period of time. So if I try to go run six miles, I'm not in shape right now. So after the first, you know, probably after the first mile, I'm going to think, oh my gosh, I have five more to go. I'm already feeling tight, right? But the psychological aspects of trying to, you know, do an endurance race um, versus peripheral fatigue. And peripheral fatigue is much better understood. And what that basically means is, um, you know, the muscles are fatiguing because you're running out of, fuel to produce the energy for muscle contraction. And there's a lot of biochemistry behind that. But basically, um, you know, I don't have any glucose left circulating in my blood to help make ATP to fire the muscles, or I've run out of locally available oxygen that I've stored there for muscle fuel, or, you know, that sort of thing. So um, that's better understood. One um, aspect of fatigue, though, is the idea in strength and conditioning is that you can train up to be more fatigue resistant. And that's what a marathon training program would be, right? I mean, you've got to train your body to resist the tiredness and to be in shape to do the activity. We don't really think about that much at all for voice. We just assume that you graduate with your teacher degree and you can walk in, in the classroom in the fall and do this heavy voice load without training up for the task. Part of that is also this concept of detraining. So what happens to teachers or performers if they go on hiatus or they take two or three months off and they don't do anywhere near the vocal load that they were doing before? The body wants to be efficient, so it will down-regulate all of these mechanisms. And you've heard me talk about this thing before. Um, and then you've got to read, you've got to get back in shape to do the test. But again, we don't really think about that. Um, you know, I, I think a good analogy that I, I think of for myself when thinking about a classroom teacher and taking summer off, you know, when I lived in Wisconsin, I could not ride my bike in the wintertime. I, I'm not, I don't ride bikes in the winter. I'm not going to put chains on my bike wheels and that sort of thing. <laughs> but if I took a spinning class in the wintertime, getting on my bike in the spring in Wisconsin didn't feel like I'd been off my bike all winter because I had done some sort of cycling dose during my off cycling time. Um, and so I'm, I wonder if classroom teachers need to use some sort of minimum vocal dose in the summer before they, go back to teaching, I wonder if touring performers or actors and singers in general, if they're on a break between roles, if they need to do some sort of minimum amount of exercise so that they're not set up to injure their voice in some way from suddenly going from zero to 60 um, without having put in that time. And, and I know from my own experience, I've talked to a few teachers who get into trouble. They come back in the fall and they've spent two or three months off. So I've had these actual conversations. I don't know what the data suggests, but um, it, we don't have any data yet. Are you serious? None. Nobody's really looked at detraining in teachers. 
okay, well, my qualitative data that I have collected, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, this is a real thing. And I think it speaks to the larger issue, which is this is a body part. The larynx is a body part. The it's lungs not special. Are, it's like right. every other muscle we have in the body. Right. right, right, exactly. And there's something you can do about it. And for me, that has a couple, um, it, it suggests a couple things. One, you can separate the, the physical function from who you are as a person. So, right, a lot of singers are very, very sensitive. We're all sensitive souls, and we're very passionate about what we do. And very, it's very tied deeply to our identity and our ego and all of those things that are important to acknowledge. Yeah. Right. But when you can talk about the body in terms of like, okay, so for instance, if an athlete is running on a track and he, his quad muscle pops, mm -hmm. we don't berate him for what, what just happened. We get the, you know, the doctor in there and the physical therapist and we take care of that person. But what you hear in the media is, well, she can't sing, she blah, 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 blah. But nobody's acknowledging that she's got a physical function issue or there's something going on. Mm -hmm. It's not her or it's him. Right. They make it deeply personal. Right. Yeah. And I think for me anyway, this is one of the, the reasons that I love this so much is because it can really open up a conversation mm -hmm. that's neutral. There's no emotion involved. It's a that's very, right. it's, it's a very practical thing that we're talking about. And absolutely. And that's why I really don't like the term voice abuse, which is just used so indiscriminately. I mean, yeah. I think clearly some people are abusing their voice and they know it. If they're engaging in a screaming contest, for example, I mean, that's, that's knowingly doing something that's dangerous for your voice. But the majority of people who are blamed for developing the voice disorder because of something that they did, it doesn't really acknowledge or respect all of the, you know, that lots of other people are engaging in that same behavior and don't end up with a voice problem. Or further, they're not, other people aren't being asked to do the, the extreme voice things that that individual is asking to do. You know, this reminds me too, you know, the, the Occupational and Safety and Health Administration that is responsible for workplace protections for our bodies says nothing about workplace protection for voice. No. Hmm. No. It, it, it'll talk about air quality, but really for respiratory health, not for voice function. It'll talk about temperature, but that's more for workplace comfort, not for voice. Um, it doesn't really set any sort of limits on how much we use our voice during the day or in what way we do it. So this begs the question, what are some interesting groups of people that you think would be, would benefit from this conversation? Not just the singers, not just the performers, teachers, yes, but who are some other groups of people that we as vocologists and, ex, you know, new researchers and, and excited voice teachers, who can we go out and talk to about voice awareness? Well, anybody that I, I think, one thing that comes to mind are choral singers, church and school. They're a very passionate group on the whole, I would say, incredibly yeah. dedicated. And I can tell you some of the churches in the Auburn, Alabama area put on these really elaborate Christmas and Easter pageants. And, and they're singing for, it's like a two hour concert with an intermission and the, the rehearsals that they engage in up to performance are incredibly onerous and very little thoughts given to asking these individuals to engage in that very intense vocal behavior for over probably a two or three week period of time up to these. And, and I think that they ought, sometimes have two performances a day. They'll do an afternoon matinee and an evening and they're singing a lot. Um, Show choir singers, I've treated a few young women who they're doing high intensity aerobic dancing and then they have to stop and immediately hit a high note while their body is breathing hard and they're trying to, their body's trying to return to homeostasis and holding a high note really beautifully takes a lot of control of the respiratory mechanism and subglottal pressure and it would be the hardest to control if you're breathing really hard because your body needed the oxygen for your muscles. So I think there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to talk to folks and just educate them a little bit about, you know, this is how the body works. And, you know, maybe you're asking it to do things that are unreasonable. And I think that the end goal can be accomplished if there's a skillful approach that kind of takes into consideration all of those things. 
Yeah, that's that's really great. What I'm hoping is somebody sees this video and they they just like light bulbs are going off and inspiration, because really, you know, you, Dr. Tiza, Kitty Verlin, all these all these folks are really pioneers in the field, and you're and this is an incredibly passionate group of people. Oh, indeed. You know, like when you go to a voice conference, it's not just like oh how are you know everybody's just kind of mm-hmm. you know on the edge of their seats and they're riveted and and I know I feel a ton of emotions because. Well, I don't really know why, but it's a very emotional experience for me yeah. and everyone else around me. And so um, I just want other folks coming up. You know, I do a talk or talk to young students mm-hmm. and so many people come up and they're like, I want to know more about this. And they're not just interested. They're like excited, interested. I agree. And I, I think what I hope my contribution can be over the next many years is to really provide evidence to support some of these hypotheses. You know, I ran into someone at the PAVA meeting and we were talking, someone was apologizing for drinking coffee. And I said, well, I said, you know, the, the latest literature really says caffeine's not dehydrating. So, you know, you could probably have your coffee. And this person, I know, and this person said to me, well, I've read that, but I don't believe it. <gasps> so I think we have to be really judicious about understanding that research doesn't prove or disprove, but it does provide evidence to support mm-hmm. or not support certain notions. And I think there's a lot of lore and mythology in voice in general that we need more basic research mm-hmm. to study. Unfortunately, a lot of the funding agencies aren't as interested in singing voice as they are telemarketers and classroom teachers, but a lot of what we learn from classroom teachers and telemarketers, we can apply to singing. And then there's one other aspect of muscle bioenergetics and training that I wanted to mention that I think will probably develop over the next few years is this idea of work-rest ratio. Mm-hmm. So in strength and conditioning with football players and soccer players, for example, there's a targeted work to rest ratio that they strive for. So for every minute of work, they expect six minutes of rest, let's say. And we haven't worked that out in voice. Hmm. And Ingo, you know, he speculated in a couple papers that maybe a one-to-one ratio is enough for rest and recovery. I would hypothesize based on the work in exercise science that we need more than a one-to-one ratio. It should be more rest per voice use. But we don't really know what the sweet spot is, especially for the kind of work that we're doing. I mean, if you're doing quiet talking, you probably don't need as much rest as if you're doing extensive loud talking. I mean, that sort of thing. But we need to we need to figure out power output and what that means for voice. And we need to figure out a lot of these parameters. Yeah, um, because because working out for voice is very different than, yes. say, muscle strength training if you're in the gym, right? Right. And you can't subtract respiratory support and articulation. I mean, maybe some of the fatigue that people perceive is really respiratory fatigue, or maybe it's um, articulatory fatigue. I mean, that's a thing. A lot of the research in voice, they'll have them do a vocal loading task. And we don't even really know what vocal loading is. So that, that's got to be worked out as well. But they'll have the person read out loud for an hour. And then they'll ask how tired they are. But I don't know that we really know whether we're getting a voice fatigue or we're getting an articulatory fatigue or respiratory fatigue or or one or more of the above. So I think there's a lot we've got to really work out. I mean, the larynx is designed to be fatigue resistant. Its number one job is to protect the lower airway from dangerous things. So it's it's got to be in shape to work, to move fast with a lot of power to get things out of our lungs that are dangerous. so I don't, I don't know that the fatigue we perceive is actually voice as much as it's maybe something else, but we, we've got to figure that out too. So just to note and to bring to everyone's attention, if you're looking for a research topic, Mary just laid, laid out, oh, I don't know, 25 of them. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, there is. And it's, it's great because it's just going to keep getting deeper and and it's, it's flourishing. Well, it's fun to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where do you see the future of vocology heading? Um, Well, I mean, selfishly, I'd like to see it heading toward more truly functional assessments. A lot of the assessments that we do when a singer comes into the clinic is they're they're a snapshot in time of what a person's able to do, maybe holding out an ah or holding out an e while we look at their vocal folds with an endoscope, Um, maybe reading a standard passage like the rainbow passage. But a lot of those endeavors aren't they don't really give us an idea of the person's functional voice capabilities in their real life. So I'm hoping um, that we can get better at that. I think the vocal dosimetry 
uh, approach that's been published from the last few years. Bob Hillman's group in Boston is doing some really cutting edge work with that. Um, I, I think that that's going to make a difference in really understanding what are the requirements for your job. And then when we assess the person, we can assess, do you, are you functionally able to do what's required for your job? You know, in, in occupational therapy, they call it work hardening. You know, for example, if you run a cement mixer and one of your jobs is to carry 50 pound bags of cement up a ladder and dump it into the cement mixer, you know, for work hardening, they'll have you actually do that until you get to the point where you're in shape to do it and you can go back to work without re-injuring yourself. But we haven't really broken down all the components of what occupational voice users need to do to really understand how to train them up to right. avoid future injury. And this, this speaks to specificity too. So like you talked about riding your bicycle, if, if you had gone and done a lot of running in the winter, that wouldn't necessarily translate to your bike riding in the spring, That's right? Exactly right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So when we're doing, when we're working with voices, we have to actually um, train in a specific task. So if you're going to sing musical theater rep, you can practice some classical lit. Great. Mm -hmm. But you have to do the rep and the style that you're going to do. Yeah, and you know, I'm, I'm also kind of interested in this concept of imagined exercise, which means yeah. you imagine that you're doing it, but you're not really doing it. And, you know, there's some really compelling basic research in exercise science showing that it does uh, influence the physiology of the muscle that you think about using, but you're not actually using. Hmm. Um, and I also have some preliminary evidence that Deidre Haig in the theater department here and I are, will submit for publication. Um, where some theater students, while they are sitting quietly in a chair before audition, are actually exhibiting speech breathing patterns because they're mentally rehearsing it. So it's influencing their breathing patterns. They're not title breathing while they're rehearsing uh, their monologue in their brain. They're in training their respiratory system in a similar <gasps> way. So, I mean, there could be something to, you know, imagined exercise too. Which yeah. We haven't really studied much either, so. So you could be riding the train in into the city to do an audition and you could be rehearsing your piece in your head and actually getting, you may be getting some physiologic benefit from it. Yeah. That's really exciting. This is yeah. wonderful. I feel like I could talk to you for hours and hours. So maybe we'll meet again someday and, and go over some other things. Um, but just a couple of fun questions to kind of wrap it up. What is your favorite voice recovery story? Or do you have one that you like to talk about? Well, I've had a few clients who come in without voice at all. And it's, it's for some clients, and they're not all this easy. Um, I, I, the way I describe it to my students is I trick them into using their voice with something that they don't typically do with their voice. So um, I'll have them um, with a cup of water. I'll have them just tip the, the water into their mouth and then bubble into the glass of water. First, I'll just have them bubble. Well, actually, what I'll do is I'll say, let's see if you can do this. And I'll do it. And I'll give them a cup of water and they'll do it. I'll say, wow, do that again. And then I'll point out that they're actually producing their voice. And then their eyes get really big. And I'll say, and let's see if you can do this. One, two, three. And they'll do it. And then it's like it turns their switch back on. Oh, there's my, that's your voice. That's your voice. And then it's like, wow. And so they'll literally in five or 10 minutes go from, you know, having weeks or months of no voice to having their functional voice back. And then I'll usually have them call a significant other just to surprise them on the phone because they haven't talked to them for, you know, like they haven't had a voice for a while. So yeah, yeah. Those, those are fun. Those are really fun. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah. And our schedulers are like, holy cow, what did you do? Because, you know, they, they come in whispering and then a few minutes later they come out with their voice and, and the, so it's kind of funny, but have you ever had, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm just applying voice physiology to it. It's nothing magical. It's, anybody can do it. Right. And that's what I hear, <laughs> especially with straw, like we'll have somebody sing a passage and then blow bubbles into the straw, very legato, long lines. And then they, all of a sudden the quality of their voice is different. And they're like, this is magic. And I'm like, no, this is science. And their range is bigger because they're not too tight. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're using airflow all of a sudden. It's just, it's wonderful stuff. And that's what I love. And I, I love talking to Dr. Tietz about it too, because he was in the same boat most of us are, which is like, why am I doing this exercise? What's actually going on? And, and I don't know that we have all the answers. We certainly don't have all the answers, but we're learning more. And that makes it easier to figure out 
how to actually give a specific exercise for a certain function. You know, it's kind of, you're helping me realize it's all going together and tying together. And yeah. you know, and being an educator keeps me honest because my students, I mean, I need to explain to students why I'm doing what I'm doing. And then they'll ask me, how does that work? And I have to have a good answer. So right. Right. For me. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. And so what's your very favorite voice exercise? If you could only have one vo voice exercise oh. ever. Tongue bubbles. Okay. Best one. Loosens the jaw. I had a lot of problems with tight jaw in college and Janet Alcorn had me do a lot of vocalises, even songs doing lip bubble or tongue bubbles. I, that's what I call them. They're not trills. Trills are inside the mouth. Right. This one is very messy. But I find for a lot of people, it's really the fastest and most durable way to relax the base of tongue and the jaw if the person's got a lot of tongue and jaw tension that's preventing their full range from coming out. That's wonderful. That's Thank you. Absolute fave. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, John Nix calls that one, um, or he calls it a high spit factor exercise. It is a high spit. Yes, it is indeed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. That's wonderful. Well, I would just thank you so much for your time and, thank you and for asking me. It's such a privilege. It really is. And and an honor for me to to be able to spend so much so much time with you like this. And hopefully you'd be willing to do this again someday as things develop and we all grow and change. I would love to talk with you again. Fun to catch up after I have more to tell. So absolutely. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome.